can you imagine a TikTok that's just a really cringy apology video? With against uh, next, <laughs> like next to the, you know the, you know the song like is it, is it busted or something or bus it? Or, you know when it's like bus it, bus it. Hello and welcome to Let's Get Digital, the game show for modern marketers. And speaking of modern marketers, today we are joined by three very talented contestants. With us, we have Laura Wong, social media strategist at Booking.com. We also have with us Jason Bradwell, senior director of group marketing and communications at Delta Tray. And finally, we're happy to welcome Jessica Ivatich, social media manager at Vote.org. As always, I'm your host, Megan Crawford, content marketing manager at Sculpt. At the top of every episode, we pick which game we'll be playing. So let's go ahead and spin the wheel to see what we're playing today. The name of the game is Best Practice. I hope you have your poker face ready because this game requires a not insignificant amount of bluffing. I'll show you a question about social media best practices then everyone will anonymously submit their answer, including me. You'll all vote on the quote unquote correct answer, AKA the answer that you think I submitted. You'll receive a point for every person who chooses your answer and you'll receive two points every time you correctly guess my answer. Oh, and no voting for your own answer. That's boring. And that's it. Are we all ready to play? Let's do it. Well, then we will move on to round one. So all of the questions are about social media channel best practices. And here is your first question. There are a lot of social media channels out there and new ones are cropping up all the time. So it can be difficult to know as a brand, which channels should we be on? What is the most important thing to consider when choosing your primary channels of engagement? my spelling skills to the test here. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Well, that is everyone's answers in, so I will show you what your options are. Uh, everybody was on the same page with this one. <laughs> which platforms your target audiences are using, which channels are your audience using, where your target audience lives online. You have to pick channels where your customers are spending their time during working hours and without. We will now move on to voting. Okay, so Jess and Laura, you both chose D. This guy. That was Jason's answer. So that is good job, Jason. <laughs> Two points Thanks. to you. Um, so well written. <laughs> your spell checking paid off. Jason, you chose B. I think that was mine. It was the question one. Yes, that was Laura. Uh, my answer was C, where your target audience lives online, but we all pretty much had the same answer, so maybe less subjective than I thought it was. <laughs> or we're just all <laughs> on the same wavelength. <laughs> okay, let's move on to question number two. Don't forget about secondary channels, which if done correctly can be great for experimentation and growth. What is one of the first things you should do when a new social media platform emerges as a potential secondary channel? All right, that is everyone's answers in, so we will go ahead and show what those options are. We had test it out, prepare a small experiment to share with your CEO before they ask for a complete strategy, secure your brand's username, even if you're not 100% sure you'll publish on the channel, and observe how influencers and content creators are using it. They are the masters of experimentation and figuring out what works on new channels. These are all excellent answers. Um, these are really good. <laughs> these are all really, really good answers. Okay. One person voted for D. That was Jess. You voted for D. That was mine. Awesome. One point to Laura. And also, that's a really good answer. And then two people voted C, which was my answer. So two points to Jason and two points to Laura. Laura is racking up the points on that question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will move on to question number three. So we know that the best social media platform for your brand is pretty dependent on your industry, niche, and audience. 
but it'll probably come to you as no surprise that LinkedIn tends to be at the intersection of all of those things if you're in the B2B space. What is the best way to expand your brand's reach and influence on LinkedIn without buying ads? Everybody has submitted their answer. We have employee advocacy, training your staff to use LinkedIn to grow their personal brands, but only if they want to do it with employee advocacy and executive social activation. Content published by personal accounts does better than company page content. Use the function that allows page admins to invite up to 100 of their connections to like the page. Or D, creating posts with clear or thought-provoking questions as comments will help the post gain reach. If you're all ready, we can go ahead and vote. Okay. Jess, you voted for D. That was mine. So that is one point to Laura for Jess guessing her answer. And then Laura and Jason, you both voted for B, which was my response. So two <laughs> points each to Laura and Jason. We are moving right along. Here is question four. Twitter first started hyperlinking hashtags to search results for the tagged words in July of 2009, although platform users have been using hashtags to categorize content and search more effectively for years. According to Twitter for Business, what is the current best practice for hashtag use? Okay, so that is everybody's responses in. A, use sparingly and be specific. B, limit to one to two tags per post. C, not too long and not used by another brand or community. And D, use hashtags intentionally. Don't hashtag every word, but use the feature to call attention to specific topics or events. So we will go ahead and move on to voting. Well, this is how voting came in. We had two votes for D, use hashtags intentionally, don't hashtag every word. Whose answer was that? That was Jess's answer. Okay, so two points to Jess for those two guesses from Jason and Laura. And then Jess, you voted for A, which was... Oh, that was me. Sorry, that was me. I yeah. Think. yeah. Yes, that was Jason's answer, uh, which was be specific and use them sparingly. So that is one point to Jason for getting Jess's vote. Um, and we will move on to the final question of round one. When done right, user-generated content makes for high impact, low effort content that is authentic and compelling. Some platforms like Facebook and Twitter have built-in features that make sharing UGC easy. Others, like Instagram, require a little bit more creativity. If you choose to make UGC a part of your Instagram strategy, what's the first step when sourcing content to share? All of the answers are in explicitly asking the user's permission to share their content. It's not enough to just tag them in the post. Ask for proper permission to share from the original content creator. Ask for permission from the user before reposting their content as UGC. And always ask the creator for permission to use the content and tag them appropriately. So your options are um, A, B, C, or D, all of which amount to the same thing, so it's anyone's guess. Um, and I think that what we're learning here is that it is important to ask for permission. <laughs> so we will go ahead and move into voting. Megan, what's your opinion on M dashes? I'm just kidding. Don't answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's fishing, <laughs> and I will not allow against, it. Is that against the rules? <laughs> <laughs> um, my opinion on M dashes is actually public knowledge. Um, however, uh, okay. whose answer was D? Always ask the creator for permission to use the content and tag them appropriately. That was me. That was Jason's. And so he gets two points as Laura and Jess both voted 
for his answer. My answer was A, um, which is the M dash answer. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I gave myself away. Um, but so that is two points to Jason for correctly guessing which one of those exceedingly similar answers belonged to me instead of his opponents. I believe I've tweeted from the Sculpt Company account multiple times about my love affair with M dashes. So <laughs> it's not. I didn't a... know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'd, I, I'd selected it before I asked you. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. It was a All right. for me because I spotted that M dash. So yeah. Good to know. Good yeah. To know it is. Well, now I've given it all away. <laughs> <laughs> this is becoming more of a detective game than a, than a trivia game. Everyone start putting M dashes in your uh, answers to trip up your opponents. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that is the end of round one. So we will now move into round two, all about worst practices. Being a brand online is a precarious balancing act on the tightrope of public opinion. On the one side, being authentic and relatable. On the other, being overly branded and corporate -y. Tipping too far in either direction can land a brand in hot water. What is the most likely thing to get your brand canceled on Twitter? Everyone's answers are in, so we will now share them. All right. What is the most likely thing to get your brand canceled on Twitter? Tweeting out a tone-deaf response to valid criticism or concern trying to be edgy with an offbeat joke when it's not a regular part of your brand voice or social media, using memes to try to make sales or gain new customers, and finally, performative activism. A brand must back up their words through action instead of simply hopping on a bandwagon. All right, so I will go ahead and let you vote. All right, all of our votes are in. And we had one vote for B, which was trying to be edgy with an offbeat joke. This guy. All right, that was Jason's answer. So one point to Jason for that vote. And then we had two votes for A, which was tweeting out a tone deaf response. And that was my answer. So two points each to Jason and Jess. I would say if I had to pick which of these is truly the worst thing you could do as a brand on Twitter, I would go with D, which was uh, Jess's answer. So honorable mention to that answer for sure, because especially right now, we're just seeing a lot of that and it makes me sad. <laughs> yeah, if we weren't playing a game, I would definitely go with that one. Yeah, that, I that, think that that's that the correct, really that's one. the most correct answer. <laughs> Only because you didn't um, put an M dash, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was it. The camouflage of the M dash. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> we will move on to question number two. Social media can drive a decent amount of traffic to your website if you know what you're doing. Not all channels are created equal, though, when it comes to site traffic generation. And Instagram, in particular, is notoriously iffy in this category. What is the least effective way to drive traffic? from Instagram. That is everyone's answers in, so I will now reveal them to you. First up, we have listing a URL directly in a post caption. It doesn't create a hyperlink. Um, some people need to hear that. <laughs> Not using Linktree or some other similar service in the URL field of your bio. Don't limit your options. Putting a link in the copy of your feed post. Or finally, adding a full URL to your post caption instead of adding it to your bio link. Uh, so I feel like we all have a similar gripe. Uh, so we will go ahead and start the voting. It's such a toss up. <laughs> yeah, especially because they're such similar answers, right? Um, all right. Well, we had two votes for A, which was Jess's answer. Two points to Jess for getting Laura and Jason to guess her answer, and an additional two points to Jess for correctly guessing which one was mine, which was C, putting a link in the copy of your feed post. 
Um, so that's a total of four points to Jess that question. Um, and I also I saw all of you putting those <laughs> putting those M dashes in your <laughs> in your replies. <laughs> oh, that was so funny, and we all had essentially the same answer. Um, yeah. So if you're watching this, don't put a link in your Instagram post. It doesn't create a hyperlink. <laughs> Here is question number three. There are lots of things to think about when setting a publishing schedule, from how often you'll post, to what you'll post, about, to which channels you'll post on, to when you'll post. What's the worst advice you could give to a brand about when to post on social media? Everyone's answers are in, so let's take a look. You should post at least every day to maximize engagement. Post all the time, morning, noon, and night, to guarantee your content is seen. Not experimenting with which times are best for your audience as it varies from brand to brand. And finally, the best time to post on LinkedIn is after 9 p.m. on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So let's go ahead and vote. Okay, everyone has voted. So we had one vote for C. That was mine. Okay, so we have one point to Laura for that awesome answer. And then we had two votes for D, which was my answer. So that's two points each to Jason and Laura. Good job. <laughs> um, but all of those are in fact terrible advice. Please don't do any of those things with your social media publishing <laughs> schedules. All right, we are moving on. This is question number four. With platforms like TikTok, Reels, and YouTube Shorts continuing to grow, short form, social first video is a pretty great opportunity for boosting reach right now, especially if you've got some evergreen content to repurpose. Careful though, not all long form content makes the transition to a snappy 15 second video easily. What kind of content shouldn't be repurposed as a TikTok, Reel, or YouTube short? Okay, we have everyone's answers in, so I will go ahead and show them to you. A, landscape video that can't be easily cropped to vertical. B, TV ads. They're designed to give the payoff at the end, where a short form video needs to hook the viewer from the beginning. C. An apology video from the CEO. Or D, content that isn't evergreen or has a specific timestamp. Okay, those votes came in pretty quickly. We had one vote for C, an apology video from the CEO. That was me. That was Jason's. <laughs> Uh, worth yes. getting the full points. Worth it. <laughs> worth it. <laughs> that is, uh, that would be a terrible, terrible, th like, can you imagine a TikTok that's just a really cringy apology video? But against, uh, next, <laughs> like, next to the, you know, the, you know, this song, like, is it, is it busted or something? Or bust it? Or so, you know, when it's like, bust it. So bus improperly it. use it, yes, using the yeah. sound just in the most incorrect way possible. And then it's also like a very insincere, uh, not enough kind of apology for something that the CEO, did. yeah, that would be, exactly. I almost want it to happen just so that I can see it. Okay, uh, and then we had two people vote for A, landscape video that can't easily be cropped to vertical, which was my answer. So two points each to Jason and Laura. Um, but I think all of those answers were really good examples of what not to do with your short form video strategy. Uh, the TV ad ones, that was Laura. That was a very good deep cut. I wouldn't have even considered that. All right, we are moving on to the final question of round two. Here we go. Community management is an essential part of a well-rounded social media strategy, at least if you want engaged followers and satisfied customers. Plus, being proactive, responsive, and transparent with your community management builds goodwill and trust with your audience. What is a surefire way to damage trust with your brand in terms of community management? Awesome, everyone's answers are in, so we will go ahead and take a look at those. A, say you'll do something and then not follow through, particularly as it relates to social causes. B, 
deleting negative reviews or critical comments on posts. C, being unresponsive. Lack of direct communication with your community is a surefire way to damage trust. And D, to not respond to comments or turn comments off on your posts. So we will go ahead and start the voting. We had everyone vote for B, which was deleting negative reviews or critical comments on a post, which was in fact my answer. So either y'all are getting better at guessing um, <laughs> my writing style or um, you all just, just thought that that was the correct answer. I'm not sure. Um, but that is two points to everyone for correctly guessing that question. Okay, we are gonna go ahead and move into round three. This is our third and final round of the game. And this round is about cautionary tales of brands on social media that have done things that would not be considered best practice. All right, here is your first question of round three. The majority of consumers are no longer satisfied with brands remaining silent on social and political issues. They want you to take a stance, but it's possible that having no take is still better than having a bad take, at least in the court of public opinion. Case in point, what did The Gap tweet while an entire nation waited on the results of a hotly contested presidential election? Everyone's vote is in. Um, and I will go ahead and show this to you now. A, a sweater split down the middle with the colors of both political parties. B, an image of a blue and red hoodie with the copy, the one thing we know is that together we can move forward. C, blue or red, doesn't matter, we're all in this together. Or D, the gap will deliver your purchase faster than the states count their ballots. So we will go ahead and open it up to voting now. Okay, we had one vote for C, blue or red, it doesn't matter, we're all in this together. Who wrote that one? I had High School Musical in my head the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I almost started um, humming it and then I thought that would give it away. <laughs> that would give it away. Um, also, we don't have the rights to that song and Disney will copyright strike us faster oh, sure. than you can say <laughs> wildcats in the house. Okay, so that is one point to Jason for getting one of his opponents to guess his answer. And then we had two votes for B, which was an image of blue and red hoodie with the copy. The one thing we know is that together we can move forward. And that was my answer. So that is two points each to Jess and Jason. Good job. I really like the gap will deliver your purchase faster than the states count their ballots though. Jess, oh, that, that feels like something that a brand would like off the cuff, like some social media manager just off the cuff would say. All right, here is your next question. The dramatic changes to how we lived, interacted, and marketed in 2020 pulled the collective rug out from under most of us. And while brands adjusted and moved forward as best they could, marketing gaffes definitely still happened. Take, for example, US grocery store chain, Giant. What poorly planned tagline did they run in their holiday ad? Okay, that is everyone's answer in, so here they all are. A. At least this year wasn't as bad as the Game of Thrones finale. Uh, B. Everything you need to gather for the holidays, especially hand sanitizer. C. We respect your freedom. Masks are optional in our stores. Or D. Plan a super spread. Okay, we will go ahead and start voting. Okay. We had one vote for C, which was, we respect your freedom. Masks are optional in our stores. Whose answer was that? That's mine. I had no idea. So I just wrote like the craziest American thing I could think about. Sorry. Such a good answer. I, that's what I thought. I thought I could see that happening. Yeah, I could see that happening. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are stores who've made statements like that in uh, the US, so. <laughs> Um, that, uh, fortunately, that was not what Giant went with. Um, that was one point to Laura for correctly duping um, Jason. And then Jess and Laura, you both voted for D, plan a super spread, which was 
my answer. Um, and in fact, the tagline that they ran that campaign with, which is absolutely wild that that is a thing that <laughs> happened. The full tag was um, hosting question mark, plan a super spread. Uh, and the, you know, just a bad choice of words for so many reasons. We will now move on to the third and final question of round three and the game. Shockvertising campaigns are nothing new. In the age of social media though, they just tend to get more traction than they used to. And while it's ultimately up to your brand if you're willing to gamble on that kind of publicity, I do wonder if the adage, all publicity is good publicity still holds water. Take for example Burger King's recent blunder. What was the campaign they ran on International Women's Day in 2021 that earned them immediate backlash? Okay, everyone's votes are in, so here they all are. They ran an image that said, women belong in the kitchen. B. They ran with the tagline, women belong in the kitchen, to highlight a scholarship scheme that would sponsor female cooks to go to college. C. They tweeted, women belong in the kitchen, to start a dialogue about the lack of women chefs in the restaurant industry. And D, a newspaper ad and social campaign that said, women belong in the kitchen to promote its program that encourages women to become chefs. So we will now go ahead and vote. This was a terrible one. It was quite bad. I was so <laughs> fired up about it. And I tweeted Fernando Machado, their CMO, about it. And I was like, why couldn't you just post the full copy? They knew what they were tweet? doing. They like, knew what I they agree. were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Her queen was right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, do you guys remember in 2020 when um, Shell gas station put a tiny apostrophe between the E and the L so that it said Sheel? And they were like, for International Women's Day. <laughs> Anyways, um, here is uh, here's the vote count. We had one vote for A, which was an image that said women belong in the kitchen. Whose answer was that? That was mine. I was typing so short on my phone. So. <laughs> You're good. Um, okay, so that's one point to Laura for that guess. We also had one person guess D, a newspaper ad and social campaign that said women belong in the kitchen to promote the program uh, for women chefs. Whose answer is that? That's one point to Jess for getting that guess. And then Jason, you correctly guessed that C, they tweeted women belong in the kitchen, uh, yada yada, all of that garbage <laughs> was my answer. And that is correct. So two points to Jason there. Um, but Jess actually did bring up a point that I did not, which is that they not they didn't just tweet it, they also took out a full page ad in the New York Times with the stuff about the scholarship below the fold. They knew exactly what they were doing. So yeah. um yeah. It was still gross. It, it was <laughs> it was it was it was gross, but at least the print ad, like you had an immediate you know, uh, a feeling of rage, but then you read it and you're like, it's yes. distasteful, but I can kind of see what they were trying to get at. Um, mm -hmm. The tweet was just, you know, in isolation. Yeah. I mean, how many right. people re think like, oh, I'm going to read that and then I'm going to see what the comments are and see if there are any right. other tweets. Their whole thing about how we're trying to start a dialogue in the comments was... Mm, no. Terrible. No, no. Pretty bad. Um, well, with that as our kind of... <laughs> distasteful last question um that wraps up our game which makes our winner jason so <laughs> congratulations congrats jason oh, thank um, you. and in addition to a week's worth of coffee on us here at sculpt we will also be making a donation on your behalf to the nonprofit organization of your choice there's a really important charity that operates here in, in Dorset where I live called Julia's House Hospice who um, provides support to um, children who are living living with life-threatening conditions and, and also their families um, and you know they like all 
charities uh, have had a real hard time of it over the last year or so with a lot of their fundraising efforts being uh, unable to, to be seen through. So um, they and, and I really appreciate the donation in Sculpt's, Sculpt's name. Of course, we're happy to do that. Um, Julia's house it sounds like a really worthwhile cause and we're super happy to do so. Um, and to our other two contestants, Laura and Jess, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really hope that you had a fun time with this kind of new um, wacky format that we've got here. I know that I had a really good time filming it and your guys' answers were all so clever and fun to read and share. If our viewers are interested in following or connecting with you guys, where can they find you online? So you can find me on all social platforms at Lothway, L-O-T-H-W-E. It means little flower in Elvish because I was obsessed with Lord of the Rings when I was, I don't know, 13 years old making my social media usernames. Um, and I'm launching a project for social media marketers pretty soon called School of Social. So you can find that at schoolofsocial.io. That's awesome. Um, also a big, huge loader fan over here, so you're in good company. <laughs> you can find me across platforms at J Ivetich, I-V-E-T-I-C-H, and then follow along with vote.org on all platforms at vote.org spelled out in full. Awesome. Thank you. And you can find me on Twitter at Jason R. Bradwell. Uh, I host a, a fortnightly podcast called B2B Better, where I help B2B marketers be better and do better marketing. And uh, I also uh, write a weekly newsletter called the B2B Byte that talks about B2B marketing strategies and tactics for the everyday marketer. Awesome. Fantastic. And that's, that's actually a really great newsletter. If you guys aren't following it, follow it. Um, we'll put those. Thank you. Uh, all of that important information um, down below for you guys to find. Uh, and a huge thank you again to our guests and to everyone watching. We will see you all next time on Let's Get Digital, the game show for modern marketers.